Check. Yeah, so it's going to look. Okay, we're going to start then with that one minute. Sounds good. Yeah, me too. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right. Very good. Hashem Hashem Naseh V'Natsliach, Shiru Torah, Bukhim Abayim. Starting a new week, Baruch Hashem, with our um, series, Baruch Hashem, of the Jewish Ashkafa, based on the uh, Sefer and Munav Bitachon of the Chazonish. Uh, tonight's show is going to be for the Refuah Shlema and Atzlacha Rabba for Rav Ephraim Ben Shunamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora. And all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahis that continue to watch our Shurim, learn with us, grow with us and support our organization as much as they can, Be'ezad Hashem. Anyone that wants to donate and help us with all the amazing things that we're doing, you can donate on Be'ezad or on bhtorah.org. There's actually several new features that are being rolled out as we speak for uh, you guys to get some answers for a lot of the questions that you have. And Be'ezad Hashem, once they're uh, fully launched, I'll give you some more details, but you can play with the sites uh, and uh, you'll see some uh, new features there as well as the app. Uh, also, for anyone that has not yet fulfilled uh, the mitzvot uh, of Purim, uh, whether it's the uh, machatzita shekel uh, that every Jew uh, must do uh, for himself, for his wife, for his kids, even if the wife is pregnant, she has to do one for herself as well as one for the kid. Um, as uh, this is something you can do on bhpurim.org, bhpurim.org. Uh, and also, if you want to help us help the poor in Eretz Yisrael during this Purim and fulfill the mitzvah of uh, Matanot Lev Yonim, uh, you could also do it on the same website, bhpurim.org. Uh, it's a uh, common mistake or misunderstanding that people make where they spend uh, you know, all of their money on the uh, Mishloach Manot, but in reality, uh, the uh, the biggest mitzvah of Purim uh, is actually the Matanot Lev Yonim. As the Rambam says uh, in uh, multiple places that uh, the biggest mitzvah of every holiday begins with, uh, uh, is what the holiday begins with, which is to help the poor. So this is something Baruch Hashem, our organization, does on a regular basis throughout the year, but especially right before the holidays. So you can go to bhpurim.org and donate over there and Bezat Hashem help us help other people. So with that being said, one last uh, public announcement. Anyone that uh, wants to uh, have a uh, special Mishloch Manot edition uh, where they want to add the book uh, to the Mishloch Manot, anyone that uh, orders a box tonight before uh, midnight, well, uh, Bezat Hashem, will, uh, all the boxes will go out tomorrow. And Bezat Hashem, you'll have a very high likelihood that you'll get the box this week. So you'll have it for Mishloch Manot. Go to uh, bhkiruv.org or kiruvstore.org. Uh, and uh, Bezat Hashem, you'll be able to get yourself a box of this uh, special sichot. This is uh, specifically good for couples, uh, you know, or people that are actually looking to get married. Some divrei uh, Torah from Rabbi Ephraim. And his Rabbanit, 
both in English and in Hebrew. The same book comes with both. So uh, you don't need to get two sets of books. It's one book that has both. And uh, Bezot Hashem, you'll get a box of 20. If you need more than 20, then just order one and then send me a message that you need more. And Bezot Hashem, if we have extras, we will uh, send you more than one box. Uh, so with that being said, we have our series at hand where uh, the Chazunish started a new chapter, chapter number six, the chapter of Nevuah, the chapter of prophecy, where uh, really this is something that's out of the realm of uh, the uh, the ways of the world today, uh, as the uh, Gemara tells us in Masechet Baba Batra, in uh, page 12, that since the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, prophecy was taken away from the uh, the normal people uh, and uh, and actually uh, given to the Shoteh and the Katan, the uh, people that are, uh, you know, uh, mentally unstable or young kids. Uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu gives the, gave them the uh, whatever prophecy is still left in this world uh, will be transmitted to such people. Now, why would Hashem do such a thing? Why would Hashem give the uh, prophecy uh, to uh, to crazy people, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, and uh, for young kids? You know, many times uh, we hear stories of uh, young kids that have uh, different dreams where they see tzaddikim or they see the future. Uh, and, uh, and we see, we see that this, uh, some of these dreams actually come true. Now, please do not send me a whole Megillah about the dreams that your killed, uh, your kids had in the last week or the last month, or even in their lifetime. I'm not a dream interpreter, uh, nor can I do anything about it. Uh, even if the dream is true, but the point being is, is that, uh, sometimes kids have dreams that actually have a bit of prophecy in them. Uh, and uh, why would Hashem do that? Why would Hashem give prophecy to a child? Why would Hashem give prophecy to an autistic person? Uh, it's a something that uh, perhaps we should have asked many times before, and the answer is, as Rabbi Ephraim explained to me, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took this gift away. He took the gift of prophecy away, uh, you know, over the last couple of thousand years, but he didn't, once Hashem gives, you know, something to the world, he doesn't take it away officially. So what, what happens? It has to remain in the world, if you will. It has to remain in the world. And therefore, he gave it to them. Why give it to them? Why not give it to, uh, I don't know, to anything else? Very simple. No one will pay attention to them. If a kid tells you, listen, there's going to be a, a war starting or there's going to be a terrorist attack, in uh, three weeks, in this and such place, nine out of ten people are not even going to pay attention to uh, to that kid even completing the story. And the last tenth will say, oh, wow, wow, ooh, wow, ah, and then go back to their life. No one will take it to heart. And that's actually a reality. The same concept is with people that have, uh, you know, issues that are, uh, you know, uh, uh, mental issues. No one is going to take them seriously. Uh, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu made sure that the prophecy remains in the world, but yet it is not something that uh, is um, so, something that people pay attention to. Now, I have to say also that there are sometimes people that are an exception. What's an exception? Sometimes a person has a dream uh, or a near-death experience or some type of uh, a combination thereof. And uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to give them uh, a, a bit of prophecy. As the sages say that, uh, you know, while most dreams are full of nonsense that are the imagination of a person, things that you saw in your life, things that you saw that week, you know, things that you saw that year, you went to the zoo and uh, decided to buy a hot dog there. So you have a dream about, you know, elephants walking around while they're eating hot dogs. You know, people have all types of dreams, but sometimes, the Gemara in Masechet Brachot says, the dream will have one-sixtieth of a prophecy. It's not a full prophecy per se, but it's one-sixtieth of a prophecy. And something like this actually happened recently. Uh, just in the last couple of months, there was a uh, older woman in Eretz Yisrael that uh, had a uh, some type of dream uh, where uh, she actually told her family that there's going to be a uh, attack on Tel Aviv uh, by uh, a couple of uh, terrorists 
uh, that are going to try to cause major damage. Uh, and uh, once uh, we heard this, or the Friend let me know, and he said, okay, we have to do a special mission in Tel Aviv, stop everything else that we're doing in Eretz Yisrael, we're giving uh, distribution of books in, uh, in Yerushalayim, in, uh, in other places in, uh, in Israel, stop it, we have to go do some distribution in Tel Aviv, and uh, at least try to bring more merits to the place, and Baruch Hashem, we did it, and uh, whether it was uh, because of that or uh, uh, helped with it is irrelevant. We saw that there was a uh, attempt of a terrorist attack on Tel Aviv on the exact day that this woman said it was going to happen, uh, but it was stopped. It was stopped by Hashem. So again, everyone can take that and uh, decide what they want to uh, uh, understand from it. Point being is, is that we're not supposed to uh, take these uh, prophecies and make uh, you know our lives revolve around them uh, same way that we don't uh, watch the news in any way shape or form and even if you happen to be one of the unfortunate ones that uh, watched the news and got depressed for the day as a result of the news that you watched and uh, absorbed all of the tuma that uh, they deliver and the lies uh, that come along with it uh, and you don't make your life revolve around the news. Why? Because the news, if you've watched it for the last 50 years or 500 years, has always been the same. It's full of things to cause you to be upset, to cause you to fear, to cause you to uh, worry. Why? Because that's what gets people to watch again. If you ever see a news station discuss any type of good news, let's say somebody, I don't know, uh, got, uh, you know, miraculously uh, saved from something, or they won the lotto, or whatever good story is, that story will appear for just a few seconds, once and never again. But if somebody got shot, somebody got murdered, somebody got raped, somebody, uh, uh, you know, got caught conspiring to do something evil, somebody is, uh, you know, wants to say things that are evil, they will hide, highlight them in every network multiple times a day until you're bleeding from your ears. Why? Because that's what the news does. But yet people don't want to listen to me. So they continue watching the news and wasting their life away. Needless to say, the Satan will tell you that this is good. Why? Because you need to know what's going on. You need to know what's going on as if it's going to help you. Now, if you were at the time of the prophets and you listen to the prophets, that's good news. Why? Because even though the prophets brought bad news, it's good news. Why? Because you can do something about it. They're telling you the warnings of God in order for you to be able to do something about it. But unfortunately, what many people don't realize is that even though the prophets did not succeed in getting Am Yisrael to do tshuva in time, the Chachamim are still here in order to get Am Yisrael to do tshuva in time. And you say, wait, what's the connection between the Chachamim, the, uh, the, the scholars and the prophets? As the Gemara says, Chacham tov mi navi. The Chacham is better than a Navi. To be a Torah scholar is even greater than being a Navi. Why? Because a Navi, a prophet, is only a prophet when Hashem allows him to be a prophet, allows her to be a prophet, meaning it's not 24 hours a day. They can't just receive prophecy whenever they want. Hashem has to decide to give it to them at a specific time, requires specific preparation. It's a whole thing. It could be a prophecy today and nothing for several years. It could be a prophecy today and nothing ever again. So just because someone gets a prophecy doesn't mean that they're a prophet all the time. And, uh, but on the other hand, and someone is a chacham, someone is a Torah scholar, so long as they continue remaining dedicated to the Torah, they're always a Torah scholar. And they can always tell you the words of God and what he told us in the Torah, regardless of what time of the day it is. So... We have to understand that while we are not prophets, while we are uh, not necessarily even in the, uh, uh, close to being prophets, we can still act as if we are children of prophets because we all are the children of prophets. That's what we call Am Yisrael, that we're all the children of the ones that came out of Egypt and all of them were prophets. But at the same token, we have to understand what prophecy is. Who, what, when, how. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah says that 
Am Yisrael had 1.2 million prophets, but yet only 55 were selected to be quoted in the Tanakh, the eternal book. Why only 55 out of 1.2 million? Because those 55 had prophecies that were relevant to every single generation, while the others, the rest of the 1.2 million, had prophecies that were only relevant to their generation, to their people at the time. And therefore, they don't belong to the eternal book. It doesn't mean they weren't righteous. It doesn't mean that they weren't good. It doesn't mean that their prophecies were false. Quite the opposite. But rather, it was only relevant to a specific time. But this, this actually impresses upon us the fact that every single verse in the Torah, in the Tanakh, is actually relevant to us as individuals as well as a nation in every single day of our life. We just need to know how to learn it. We just need to know how to understand it. But the verse, regardless of what verse you pick, is relevant to each and every single one of us. Now, the Chazanish wants to let us know about these prophets. What were they like? What were they like? How are they? How did they get to be prophets? Did they fill out some type of job application? Uh, male? Yes. Uh, you know, married? Yes. Uh, you know, a Jewish? Yes. Uh, do they fill an application? Looking for a salary? Willing to work for free? Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, what, what do you get? What, how do you get to be a prophet? What were they like? In fact, Rabotai Kalim, what most, most people don't know about prophets is that some of them were also, many of them, uh, were called the crazy ones. Like Jeremiah, for example, and others were called the crazy ones. Why crazy ones? Because when they would receive prophecy, their bodies were not normal anymore. And this is not anything that the movies can ever portray. Because their bodies were no longer normal. And I don't mean their bodies started becoming some light and they started floating in the air or anything. What I'm talking about, their bodies were receiving a prophecy and they were no longer able to handle this limited fashion that we have as human bodies. And many of them had, literally would rip their clothes off, start, you know, their bodies would literally go wild. And then the prophecy would come out, whether they wanted to say it or didn't want to say it, it didn't make a difference. It came out. It came out. This, by the way, as a side note, is the reason why Yonah, Yonah and Avi, ran away from Israel. Now, you would ask yourself, wait a minute. What, what do you think, that Hashem can't just make you a prophet anywhere He wants? You know, because there are some that say, wait, there's no prophecy outside of Eretz Yisrael. This is not true. Why? Number one, we see that Moshe Rabbeinu, Obviously, he was a prophet outside of Eretz Yisrael. He was never in Eretz Yisrael. Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, prophets outside of Eretz Yisrael. Aaron Cohen, prophet outside of Eretz Yisrael. Miriam, their sister, a prophet outside of Eretz Yisrael. We also see some of the other prophets were outside of Eretz Yisrael. So, what's the point of running away, Yonah? What's the point of running away from Eretz Yisrael? Because he didn't want to give the prophecy to the Goim. Because he knew that if the Goim do tshuva, it's going to be a prosecution against the Jews. And perhaps Hashem will punish the Jewish people or his brothers and sisters. So he didn't want to do it. Fine, you didn't want to do it, but what's the point of running away? Why don't you just be quiet? Or perhaps, I don't know, go to the next, uh, you know, I don't know, go to sleep. That's because Abu Tayyip Karim Yonah knew that it's not a matter of whether Hashem can give him or not give him prophecy outside of Eretz Yisrael, because just like Hashem made the rule that there's less prophecy outside of Eretz Yisrael than there is inside Eretz Yisrael, he could also break that rule. He could change the rule. He's the rules. The reason why Yonah ran away is because he knew that the prophecy can come out of his mouth at any given moment without his control. And therefore, he did not want to be next to those Gentiles that uh, would hear the prophecy. Because again, it's not that he didn't like the Goim, but rather because he loved his brothers and sisters, the Jewish people, and he was afraid that if the Goim became more righteous than the Jews, that Hashem would destroy the Jewish people, or at the very least hurt them. 
So obviously everyone knows how that story ends. Yonah ends up getting a rebuke and a personal lesson from Hashem, getting swallowed by a fish, miraculously living inside that fish, which of course we all realize how many miracles happen in that story because it's not enough that he got swallowed by a fish and lived. It's that he lived inside the fish for several days and then miraculously was able to see through the fish's eyes. One of the things that the fish showed him was a different openings, opening to Gainom, a, uh, which is one of the three openings to Gainom, or gates of Gainom is in the ocean. He showed him also the uh, a nation of, of, uh, of small people. He uh, showed him all types of extraordinary things. He showed him even the Leviathan, the Leviathan that we will all eventually eat Be'ezrat Hashem, any one of us that's righteous and will survive. At the end of times, he also showed him the Leviathan. So this was obviously one miracle upon a miracle that Yonah got to see and eventually got to uh, bring the uh, prophecy to the Goyim. But needless to say, this is something that Yonah knew that was beyond his control. So he tried to control the one thing he controlled, which is where his legs are. He could go wherever he wants to go, but of course, Gadosh Baruch Hu convinced him, convinced him to come back. So uh, the, uh, the prophecy is a very interesting subject. Of course, there are plenty of crazy people today that think they are prophets, but usually you will see a significant difference in the behavior of the prophets of the Torah versus the crazy people of today or any other time. And actually, tonight is we're going to learn that lesson. What is, what's the difference? How do I know this guy is not a prophet? He says he talks to God. I didn't see it. I didn't hear it. But how do I know he's a prophet? How do I know he's not a prophet? I didn't hear. I didn't see. So maybe he is. Maybe he isn't. How do I know? You'll see simply by the behavior. Because there are certain requirements in order for Hashem to select you as a prophet. 1.2 million were prophets. 55 were selected to be the eternal prophets. Needless to say, anyone that's a, a prophet today is part of those 55. There'll be 56, 57, 58, and so on. So how do we see all of it? The Chazonish tells us that one should not ascribe to the creator a voice like that of human beings. But this voice is created for this particular moment so that the ear of the prophet can sense it. Sometimes prophecy comes into the heart of a human being and he pictures in his heart everything that the creator has awakened his spirit and his soul to do as the creator has command, commanded him or to speak to whoever he has told the prophecy to. He was told to prophecy to. So we see from the Tanakh that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells the prophets messages to go bring to somebody else. He told Moshe Rabbeinu to give messages to Paro. He told Eliyahu Navi to give messages to Achav. He told different prophets messages of who to give and when to give. And every time we read it, it is written in human format, meaning that it sounds like Hashem speaks to them like, you and I are speaking today. You hear my human voice. You thereby agree that I'm human. This is a problem when you apply the same logic to God. When the Torah says God spoke to Moshe, God spoke to Aaron, to Yeshaya, Isaiah, to Yechezkel, Ezekiel, it doesn't actually mean the same thing like your own spoke. Because the voice of God is not the same thing as the voice of man. And I don't mean the tone is much deeper, like the movies make some loud, scary voice. No, it's simply not the same. The message is written in such a way, just like the rest of our Torah is written in such a way, for the human ear to understand, because we need something in order for us to digest it. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote the Torah in such a fashion that we would be able to understand it in our own way, in our own dictionary that we have, in our own vocabulary that we have, in our own logic that we have, based on the rules we're aware of. If he told us, what does an angel really look like? 
look like or what is the voice of God really is, we simply would not have anything to compare it to and therefore we would just simply not be able to understand anything. So when it says the voice that was spoken to this uh, prophet, don't understand it as some scary voice, deep voice, old man voice, crying voice, angry voice. Don't understand it as voice at all. Just understand that there was a communication. There was a communication between God and the prophet. And the prophet understood very well. When God speaks to you, there is no question. If you ever have any dream, vision, or some type of spiritual experience that sometimes people have through meditating or taking drugs or whatever it is that they do, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, I think God spoke to me. It, already, you think you think it's not God. The moment you think, it's no longer God. Why? If God speaks to you, you know. You know. So here we see that the message or the form of communications that God has with his prophets is it's written as he spoke but not to understand it the same fashion. This is very, very important because the moment we start actually portraying God in human form, we're starting to veer away from God and we start going to idolatry. So this is important. That, and that's why the, uh, the uh, Chazonish mentions it here. Now the second uh, part of this chapter goes further into describing these prophets. And the Chazuri says as follows, a prophetic connection between the creator and his creations is one of the foundations of the creation of the world. Such was the Hashem's plan to create man, to grant him wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, as well as the ability to hear the prophetic words of the creator. For the purpose of man is his being created with two inclinations, the good and the bad. That is the natural inclination towards that which is immediately pleasurable and also a desire that comes from the intellect for wisdom, acts of kindness and other good deeds. So, so far we're seeing that the master plan of HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not only to create a world for us to eat, sleep, procreate, cause some trouble. No, no. It was also to communicate with Him. It was also to communicate with Him, to speak to our Creator. And one of the things that we see here that seems initially like it doesn't fit is it also mentions that this creation, us, has a good inclination and an evil inclination. What does that have to do with the purpose of the world? Create man, grant him wisdom, knowledge, understanding, ability to understand or hear the prophetic words of the Creator. So far, so good. But then the Chazonish goes into something that seems like it's like a, a square and a round hole where evil inclination, good inclination, Natural inclination, which is pleasurable, desire to, uh, to that comes from intellect and wisdom and kindness. What does that do with prophecy? We'll see in a moment. Hashem's will was that man would scorn evil and choose good. But not all of the good can be known by way of intellect. Rather, rooted in him is the ability to choose to do good. To the point that the person will be capable of achieving prophecy. And then Hashem will command them regarding what is forbidden and should therefore be refrained from. And the good deeds that he is obligated to do. So here we see that while it initially it seems like the good and the evil inclination didn't fit. In fact, we see that this is what seals the deal of whether prophecy exists or doesn't, whether you will be chosen as a prophet or not chosen as a prophet, where certainly there is good and evil. Certainly there is good 
that you can choose through your own wisdom, your own intellect, the tools that Hashem gave you. But there are some things that are good that your intellect can never get to. There are some things that are good that your wisdom can never get to. You're simply not going to have that thought. You're not going to have that understanding without prophecy. Without prophecy. Now, how do you, how do you get this? How do you get this? As a result of doing good, the more a person perfects themselves, the more good they do as a result of their natural inclination, as a use of their wisdom, as a use of their intellect, as a restriction of themselves from things that are forbidden, that opens up that vessel that doesn't come to you naturally. That opens up that vessel of prophecy. Meaning that the good and the bad inclination are the door, or I should say the lock on the door, of whether one will receive prophecy or not. And once they do open that door of prophecy, they get further instructions that are not available in any other way possible. And the Chazunish continues, when Adam Alishon was created, he was created with the power of prophecy. Then he was prophetically commanded to observe seven negative mitzvot, that is seven things that in refraining from them, man is refraining from evil, and other mitzvot that are positive ones to be done actively. The Creator revealed to him the truth of the secret of the world. That there is a hidden Creator who created the entire world, heavens and earth and all that they contain, by the reality of his existence and his providence is constant upon all that was created. And this Creator commanded him to beware of even thinking of solutions other than the truth and of conjuring up various forms of idolatry directed at the heavenly host or of false powers. He also commanded to observe other practical mitzvot, not to steal, not to shed blood, not to commit immorality, not to eat meat from an animal that's still alive. So Adam Elishon was the first creation, but also the first prophet. And it's clear to see because the verse clearly says God spoke to him. Now, this is what Adam Elishon was expected to do. He was supposed to, in essence, fulfill the minimal amount of mitzvot primarily by not doing what God told him not to do. There is the seven Noahide laws. But there were also other restrictions that God gave him in order for him to keep his status. Obviously, the main one being don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, Adam Alishon, although he had an extraordinary appearance, he had all of the neshamot within him he still failed at that test, not because he committed immorality, not because he uh, violated Shabbat, not because he ate pig, no, rather because he broke the rule and simply did what was one of the things that Hashem forbid him from doing that wasn't even part of the seven laws of Noah. Now, this shows us that sometimes the simple, the simple logic is not enough. Meaning that we have 613 mitzvot in the Torah. Seven mitzvot are from the sages. Only seven. Now, anyone that actually ever studied the 613 laws knows that more than half of them 
are not something that you can practice today because we don't have a Bet HaMikdash. We're also not all Kohanim. And we're also not all men or all women. And the point being is, is that a very small percentage of the 613 are something you can actually even do. And in fact, even the ones that you can do, you can't do them every day. Pesach is only once a year. Shabbat is only once a week. And so on and so forth. So we see that while a person will think, okay, so as long as I focus on these 613, I should be a prophet. Not necessarily. Why? Because there are some unspoken laws, what we call chukim, a chok. These are laws that are not spoken of, meaning they're not clarified, they're not even detailed, but they're known. There's common sense that's expected of each one of us that is developed when a person learns Torah, when a person goes through life, when a person has certain experience. There's a certain amount of common sense that a Kadosh Baruch Hu expects us and he actually enforces that common sense law, that chok, no less than any of the others. In fact, sometimes more stringent. As the Gemara in Masechet Gitin says, there was once a guy that uh, took a liking to the rabbi's wife. Rabbi was a young rabbi married to a beautiful wife. And this man liked this wife. But she was married already. So, what could he do? He figured, maybe I'll say something, maybe this, maybe that. But the wife was not having it. One day, this poor rabbi needed to uh, borrow some money. He needed to borrow some money to pay some bills, to do what he needs to do. And, of course, he went to this guy, because this guy is close to the community. He's fairly wealthy. And he goes to him, but he figured the best way to, uh, to go to him is by uh, sending his wife. And he sent his wife. His wife sent, she asked for some money, he gave her the money. She came home, gave the money to her husband, and this happened a couple of times. But the day, the day of judgment came up where the money was due. And the rabbi didn't have the money, didn't have the money to pay back. He's like, listen, Rabbi, I, uh, you need to pay me back. You need to pay me back. He's like, uh, listen, I'm going to try. You need to put some pressure on him. Okay, well, make sure you send some payments. Send your wife again to, uh, you know, make these payments. Long story short, one of these times that the wife went there, she didn't come home. She didn't come home. Now, she didn't sin with this guy, but she didn't come home. The next day, the rabbi asked the guy, did uh, you see my wife? She said, yeah, she came by, and uh, she left like she usually does. Gave her some money, and uh, she left. That's it. No, no, but she didn't come home. Oh, I, I don't know, rabbi. Listen, I saw her talking to some guys. I'm not really sure, but uh, if I were you, I wouldn't trust such a woman. I'd uh, divorce her right away. Because who knows what she did. You really think so? Listen, the way it looked like for me, for sure it looked like that. Poor young uh, rabbi believed this guy, thought he's out there to help him. Listened to him as soon as the wife came home. The rabbi gave her a get. That's it, I'm finished. You did something wrong. You're out. Now, this rabbi still has this debt. And he's trying to make ends meet. Ultimately, he gets to a point where he can't. And the debt holder, this guy, the rich guy, says to the rabbi, listen, uh, I need my money. One way or the other, you got to pay. I mean, it's a, uh, doesn't the Torah say? You know, people always like to use the Torah when it's not really the ideal place to use it. When it just fits their, uh, their agenda. So the rabbi says, yeah, but what can I do? If you, I mean, uh, what can I do? He said, listen, if you want, you'll work for me. Sure, okay, I'll work for you until I pay you back. So the rabbi starts working. What can I do? He goes, oh, you'll be my servant. Poor rabbi becomes the servant. So 
the uh, rabbi becomes a servant. He does all types of things. And then one day, the uh, owner tells him, listen, I, from now on, I want you to bring some food to my room in the morning. I want to, you know, I want breakfast. You, uh, I, don't want, I don't want my other uh, people to do it. You are, you know about kosher, so I want you to bring the food. Sure. Thank you, boss. At least I have a job. He comes in. He brings the plate in. And he sees that next to this man is sitting his new wife, who was the rabbi's ex-wife. And then he understands what the whole plan was from the beginning. Why he lent him the money, why he specifically asked him to send the rabbinite to collect the money, to give the money, all that stuff. And the whole story of how he told him to, to, to divorce her. But of course, now it's too late. He can't do anything about it. But that rabbi cried. And the Gemara says that those couple of tears that came out of that rabbi, the rabbi's eyes, were the final nail on the coffin when HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to destroy the world, destroy the Bet HaMikdash. And he nearly destroyed the entire world because of it. Now, the Rabbi Yisrael Misalan says, wait a minute, but technically the guy didn't violate the law. He never touched a woman while she was married. She was with the guy. She was with her husband. He never touched her. He didn't force the guy to divorce his wife. He just recommended it. Once she was free, he was allowed to marry her. You're right. He didn't violate the halacha per se. He didn't go with a married woman. He didn't, uh, you know, do, he didn't. But he still violated the chuk. He still violated the chok, and it with such a fashion to the point where HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to destroy the entire world. He says, if this is how you interpret the Torah, to be so evil like that, might as well not have a world. Might as well not have a world. So we see Rabotai that sometimes there are certain rules that are not necessarily just uh, written in stone. There are certain rules that you have to understand. Certain logic. Unfortunately, when a person does not understand where they stand, they can easily put themselves in the wrong shoes and start challenging Chachamim and even Gdoli, even Torah giants. Start questioning the Torah giants. And it's funny to me that sometimes these people that are questioning the Torah giants, needless to say, even their, their uh, Talmit Chacham of the community, do not even know the proper blessing the proper blessing and what you eat on a small cracker with some fish what's the proper beginning blessing and ending blessing they won't even know if i told you right now what blessing do you make the first blessing and the last blessing on a small ritz ritz cracker okay small ritz cracker and a piece of fish what are the proper blessings for it unfortunately i know that some of you are also going to get it wrong but i can assure you that all of the people that go against Chachamim are also going to get it wrong. Why? It's not as simple as you think. And if you can't even figure out the proper blessing for what I just said, how are you going to challenge what Rabbi Vadya said? What the Rambam said? What uh, uh, any of the Gdolei Israel did? Some of you say, well, it's not so, it's not so, what's so difficult about it? You do Mezonot, you do Sha'akol, maybe it's just Mezonot, al Mechia, al Borene Fashat. All of those things are wrong. Why? The logic? Incorrect. You didn't pay attention to the details. Now, if you did get it right, good for you. But I can assure you, it didn't come just because you studied a lot. It also came because you lowered yourself. You humiliated yourself. You've humbled yourself to become subservient to the Torah, to the Chachamim. Without that, you're never going to know the answer. Not for that, and certainly not for bigger things. Now, Rabbi Tayyikalim, the Chazonish is telling us that when Adam was created, he was given this power, this power of prophecy. He was supposed to use this power to literally talk to Hashem whenever he wanted. In fact, at some point, 
הקדוש ברוך הוא שואל אדם הראשון, all of the future generations. He showed him the future. He didn't just tell him about the end of days. He showed him what's going to happen. He showed him all of the neshamot that are within him. Who's going to come out of him? This is the neshama of Noach. This is the neshama of Moshe Rabbeinu. This is the neshama of Aaron, a Kohen. This is the neshama of uh, David the Melech. When he got to David the Melech, he said, Who, who's that? Who's that? Tell me. He said, who's that? Who's that one? I want to know more about that one. How long? Well, what is, what's his life going to be? Hashem told him, Oh, he's not going to have a uh, life. That's just the neshama. It's going to stay up in Shemaim. Whoa, why? Such a great neshama. Why not? He says he wasn't allotted any years. Adam Rishon said, I'll give him 70 of my years. I'll give him 70 of my years. Let this beautiful neshama, let this beautiful neshama live. Hashem said, deal. Chachamim tell us that as Adam Rishon got to the end of his days, he knew he was supposed to live a thousand years. But since he gave 70 years to David the Melech, he's only going to live 930 years. And that's what he lived. But he regretted it. He said, Hashem, Hashem, give me my 70 years back. I don't want to die yet. I don't want to die yet. I want, I want that 70 years back. Hashem said, no, no, no. Can't give it back to you. No, but come on, get it from somewhere else. But no, 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 don't worry. I'm not giving it back to you. Don't worry, Adam. Why? That neshama, that neshama that you gave her life, that's your tikkun. You know that mistake that you made at Gan Eden when you were born? That mistake that you made has to be rectified somehow. The neshama of David Melech is the one to rectify it because from him will come Mashiach. Ah, okay, Mesedr. So now that I did that, fine, I can go. So we see that Adam Rishon was literally unbelievable. The Gemara says that one of the Chachamim that measured different things went into the cave of Machpelah in order to measure the different graves of Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. And he saw that Adam Rishon was also there. But how did he see? Well, first, the Gemara says, as he entered the place where no one is able to enter, because anyone that entered it died on the spot. He was holy enough that he entered it and lived. Rabbi Avraham Azulai, Allah Shalom, also entered that place and lived. It's a famous story that happened uh, hundreds of years ago where the Turkish Sultan heard about the cave of Machpelah and came to visit it. Now he had a very fancy sword that was part of the family for many years. And uh, as soon as he came to the place, you know, they, there's a place where it was locked off. And he looked into it. As he bent over, the sword fell inside into the place where no one's allowed to go because that's where Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov are. So everyone was scared. But the Sultan wasn't scared. You know why? Because he wasn't going to go down there. He said, listen, soldier, go. Soldier went. They heard screaming. Pulled up the rope. Dead. Another. Soldier, go. Tied him up. Go down. Screaming. Comes up. Dead body. No blood, nothing gory, simple. Scream, dead. Scream, dead. Scream, dead. You know, one after another. Until the commander said to the uh, to the sultan, Your Highness, we're running out of soldiers. Why don't we send a Jew instead? A Yehud. But they, you have, they're going to die too. Because now we hear that they have some holy people. Bring them. They came to the Jews, said, give us one of your holy people to go and get the sultan's sword. 
Of course, everyone knew that this is most likely a one-way trip. Unless the person is extraordinarily holy to the point where Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov allow him and even want him to be there. Rabbi Avraham Azulai, Allah wa Shalom, said, I'll go. He volunteered to go. He did certain prayers, certain preparation for it. And the next day, he went down. He got the sword, came back up. Everyone obviously was bewildered at how this all happened, how this Jew, this simple Jew, survived what dozens of non-Jewish soldiers were not able to survive for a second. He was there for a while, looking, checking, apparently talking, and everything went well. Now, of course, the respect that he got at that point was very different and increased drastically after that. But the Gemara says that at the time of the Tanaim, one of the Chachamim went down there. And he saw Eliezer. Eliezer Eved Avram. He was the guard over the gate. His neshama was a, uh, or actually his body, because he's one of the ten people that went to Gan Eden and never died without dying. The Hashem chose to go to Gan Eden without dying. And Eliezer was there. Apparently Eliezer was a giant, he says, who are you? He says, oh, I'm here to see Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov to measure. So, oh, who gave you permission to come here? I see that you survived, so you must be holy, but I have to ask Avraham if he's allowing you in to do this. Wait here. Eliezer goes, comes back. He says, okay, Avraham says you're allowed to come. He says, what is Avraham doing now? He says, Avraham right now is Alone with uh, with Sarai Menu. Avraham is uh, alone with Sarai Menu. And Chacham went, saw, spoke. Eventually, he wanted to go see Adam Arishon. But he got a glimpse. And before he went further, he was stopped. No, 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 you don't have permission over here. That's already too much. Can't go see Adam Alishon. Why not? Adam Alishon doesn't give permission. No permission. And he says, the Gemara says that I saw, the only thing I saw is I saw the foot, the back of the foot of Adam Alishon. It was more shiny than the sun. More shiny than the sun. So we see from here, Rabotai, however, this, obviously this language of the Gemara is not necessarily uh, always a, uh, in the same fashion as the rest of the Torah. It's not always literal. The point being is to inspire the message, to give you an understanding that this is more than what we're used to. This is much more than what we can even understand. But needless to say, it gives us some food for thought to put us where we are, where we're supposed to be at least. But what made these prophets, not only chosen as prophets, but also why different levels of prophecy. So the Rambam, the Rambam writes in his Shmona Prakim, in chapter 7, it's actually a chapter about the prophets. And he writes as follows. This is almost 800 years ago by the Rambam. In many places in the Midrash and the Agadah, including some passages quoted in the Talmud, it's stated that there are prophets who see God concealed behind many veils and others who see him behind fewer veils. The difference depends on the extent of their closeness to God and the elevated level of their prophecy. Thus it is said that Moshe saw God behind one clear and shining, transparent veil. This is what is meant by that expression. So here the Rambam is not only going to tell us about the prophets, but is also going to show us, explain to us, how to understand these words. What do you mean, he, Moshe saw God? He doesn't have an image or likeness of an image. So what does that actually mean? And he saw him through glass, like what's the glass? This is what it's meant. Moshe 
look through a brilliant looking glass, is what the Gemara Masechet Yevamot, page 49b says. The term looking glass refers to a lens made from a shining material like diamond or crystal, as mentioned in the conclusion of Masechet Kelim. The intent of this statement is that there are intellectual virtues and ethical virtues. Conversely, there are intellectual shortcomings such as foolishness, being naive, difficulty in understanding, and there are also ethical shortcomings such as gluttony, pride, uh, anger, wrath, brashness, love of money, and the like. Indeed, there are many of these, and we have mentioned the way to distinguish them in the previous chapter four. All of these shortcomings, meaning character traits, these, everything that I'm referring to is all character traits, either the positive character traits or character trait flaws. All of the shortcomings, the character trait shortcomings are veils that separate between man and God. This was alluded to in the prophet's statement in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 2, where it says, it's your sins that separate between you and your God. Your sins, meaning the shortcomings mentioned, are veils that separate between us and him. So here, when the Torah is telling us, in the name of God, your sins are separating you between you and God, it's not always necessarily talking to just wicked people that are violating Shabbat or eating pig or idol worshiper. Sometimes it's actually talking to, from God to uh, a, a tzaddik, a righteous person. So what sins is the righteous person doing? It's the character trait flaw or lack of perfection that is causing this separation. That is causing the separation. And therefore the Rambam continues, Know that a prophet will not prophesy until he has acquired all of the intellectual virtues and most, including more form the more formidable of the ethical virtues, meaning intellectually, as far as knowledge of Torah, he has to get to the highest possible level. But as far as character traits, he has to get to a very high level, but not necessarily the highest in order for prophecy to go through him. Or her. And this is implied by our sage's statement in Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 92a, where it says, The spirit of prophecy will rest solely on a wise man who is valiant and wealthy. What does it mean, I, uh, valiant and wealthy? The term wise surely includes all of the intellectual virtues, and the term wealthy includes all of the ethical virtues. It's not talking about wealthy as far as money. It's talking about wealthy as far as character traits, meaning his is, is, is behavior is amazing. As far as level of amazing, that will distinguish between the lower prophet and the higher prophet. And therefore our sages explain, and they would say that uh, they call a person who is, uh, uh, who, is, uh, who is rich, one who is happy with his portion. What does that mean, one who is happy with his portion? This is Mishnah Masech Davot, chapter 4, first Mishnah. One who is happy with what fortune presents him and does not grieve over what fortune does not present him. So I'll skip around a little bit here to give you some other tidbits of the Rambam. He says, it's not necessary for a prophet to have mastered all of the ethical virtues to the point that he does not possess any shortcomings at all. This is evidenced by the fact that Shlomo HaMelech was a prophet, which, by the way, is a correction to what I said a couple of weeks ago in Stump the Rabbi, where I said that Shlomo HaMelech was not a prophet, because there is an opinion, one of them being the Rambam, that he was a prophet. Not everybody agrees that he was a prophet, but there is an opinion here clearly by the Rambam that Shlomo HaMelech was a prophet, and so was David. So he says that Shlomo HaMelech was a prophet, as it says in the, he brings a verse. He brings a verse in the book of Kings, chapter 3, verse 5. At Givon, God appeared to Shlomo. So this, in essence, is portraying Shlomo as a prophet, if he appeared to him. Now, we're not in a level to disagree with the Rambam. We just know 
until, you know, we knew one of the opinions is a, uh, uh, that Shlomo wasn't. And we find explicit reference to his having ethical shortcomings, meaning even though God appeared to him, he had ethical shortcomings. Overindulgence where he had many wives, uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, he had many horses, and so on. Similarly, says the Rambam, David, his father, was a prophet. This is in the book of Shmuel, chapter uh, 23, verse 3, Shmuel Bet, which says, God of Israel said to me, the rock of Israel spoke, meaning that David says that God spoke to him directly. So, David Melech says that God spoke to him directly. So obviously this shows that he was a prophet. Nevertheless, we find that David was hard-hearted. Although he directed this quality against the uh, Gentiles and killed those that denied God, and he was merciful to Jews, we nevertheless find that in the... Uh, in the Chronicles, that God did not find him fit to build the Bet HaMikdash because of the many people that he killed. So even though he killed them in the name of God, again, this was considered a flaw, if you will, in his level, in order for him to be chosen as the highest level of prophecy. But the Zohar Kadosh says that David was the highest level of Ruach HaKodesh. Moshe Rabbeinu was the master of all prophets, David HaMelech was the master of all Ruach HaKodesh. Similarly, Eliyahu HaNavi. Eliyahu HaNavi possessed the trait of anger. Although he directed it against the non-believers and the sinners, and he would focus his wrath on them, the sages explain in the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 113b, that God removed him from the world, telling him that a person with his degree of zealousness is not fit to live among people lest he caused them all to be destroyed, meaning his zealousness was so high that literally he was prosecuting against the people to the point where if Hashem would judge according to him at that moment, he would destroy the whole world and just leave Eliyahu Navi alone. That's not what Hashem wanted. Even if he was right, even if Eliyahu Navi was right, still it wasn't the will of Hashem. This also teaches us that to be zealous also has to be at the right time and at the right place. You can't just be zealous against everyone every time, whenever you want. You have to also know what is the will of Hashem. Sometimes the will of Hashem is not to be zealous at that particular moment, but at a different moment. And a person has to know how to choose their spots. Most importantly, as I said in the previous lecture, maybe about two months ago, many times people make the mistake of being zealous against other people, but not themselves where to the point where they spend most of their energy criticizing everybody else except themselves. They reach a certain level that they feel is sufficient and everyone else is insufficient, perhaps because they view that everyone else is doing less than them. The truth is that the rebuke from heaven is usually higher on the person that's zealous than the person that is uh, being zealous against, being a... Uh, 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 judge and the reason why is because if you're putting yourself in a position where you are rebuking others that means that you feel like you are higher than everybody else and if you don't really necessarily measure to the mark you're judged accordingly so if you're going to be zealous you have to constantly elevate yourself and not just reach a certain plateau you observe shabbat you keep kosher you learn a little bit of Torah, that's it you're fine mistake you're not fine. You have to continuously get higher. Continuously get higher. Many times people don't understand that. And it's a usually because they don't really have a real connection to a rabbi that's going to rebuke them or that they have an open relationship with where the rabbi is able to tell them the truth. Many times people only tell the rabbi the good news or the complaints. They never tell them the real stuff that, uh, that happens in their life that would require a rebuke. Or if the rebuke comes, they don't accept it. So here we see that the extraordinary tzaddikim 
David, Shlomo, Eliyahu Navi, all of them were at the highest possible level as far as intellect. They were extraordinarily righteous as far as character traits, but they still had flaws in their level. We could wish to just be the grain of salt or something that they uh, perhaps seasoned in one of their sandwiches. We could be a grain of, uh, of, uh, of sand that they stepped on. But the point being is, is that in their level, we see that even though they had imperfection, they still received prophecy. So here says the Rambam, despite their having these shortcomings, the prophets mentioned above were able to convey God's word. The undesirable attributes that they possessed, nevertheless, were like veils for them. Whoever had two or three qualities that deviated from the mean would see God behind two or three veils. Now, here, it's a something that the Rambam is using a language to make us understand. But how do you understand it? It's as follows. The more veils a person has between him and Hashem, the more difficult it is for them to understand the message from Hashem. What is that like? If you look at the five books of Moses versus, let's say you look at the prophecy of Isaiah, prophecy of Ezekiel, prophecy of any of the other prophets, the five books of Moses are much easier to understand as far as the literal aspect of it, not the endless messages that come from the five books of Moses. That is never ending. We're talking about just literally the message, the story, the, uh, the, the overall message, what we call the pshat. Much easier to understand what's being communicated here versus any of the other prophets. Now, even though the prophet Isaiah is considered the highest prophet aside from Moshe Rabbeinu, it's almost impossible to understand the prophecy that was given to Isaiah when you compare it to the prophecy that was given to Moshe Rabbeinu. So we see that as great as Isaiah was, you have to figure out, you need special tools of wisdom and interpretations from the sages and our oral tradition in order to truly understand what the message says, even the basic message, needless to say, the hidden message. Whereas the basic message that was told to Moshe is relatively understandable that you could understand it many times by reading the verses and understanding the language. And other times, just a little bit of help from Rashi will give you some color to understand at least what's going on. But yet there are times, there are places in the book of Isaiah where literally you can't even understand why this word is in this sentence and you still haven't finished the sentence. What this sentence is doing here, what does it even mean? Meaning that without commentary, you simply can't read it. You can end up with a different religion like they do in Christianity. So here we understand that the prophecy to Isaiah was a very high level. The prophecy to Zechariah was very high level. Ezekiel, very high level. But if you compare it to Moshe, it's no comparison. How can we see that? The veil. The veil is how clear the message is that was able to be conveyed to Moshe. The message to Moshe is clear. The message to Isaiah, to Zechariah, to any of the other prophets is not clear. It's words. You can read the words, but it doesn't mean you can understand them. And in fact, this is why they say that Moshe, his, he got to the highest level where the veil between him and Hashem was like a glass window. Whereas the others, the veil between them and Hashem was like a, uh, uh, a, um, a wall from wood that you can hear but you can't see, or perhaps even a uh, wall that's even thicker wood, or a wall from a rock, from some type of uh, a harder uh, uh, material where you could not even hear the message clearly, you almost like hear, have to hear an echo, like a batkol, 
And the bigger the veil, the more distant the voice is, the more difficult it is to decipher what the voice is saying. Whereas the level that Moshe Rabbeinu got to, it was as if he's talking to Hashem and there's really just a window between them. Or even if you talk to your friend, and let's say you're talking to your friend or your wife or your husband through a door, you can clearly understand what, what you're saying to each other. It's not perfect like you're right next to each other, but it's near perfect. It's as close to perfect as it's going to get. But if there was a door closed, if it's a wooden door, much harder to understand what she's saying. There's going to be a few more, what? What'd you say? Huh? There's going to be a few of those. If there's a wall, it's even more so. If that wall's from sheetrock, if that wall is from cement, if that wall is enclosed in so many different ways, it's almost impossible to decipher the message. So, since our sages knew, says the Rambam, Now, since Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, knew that there was no veil remaining that he had not rent and that he had already acquired all of the ethical and intellectual virtues, he sought to comprehend God and the truth of his being, for no hindrance remained. And he asked him, show me your glory. But God said that it was impossible for Moshe Rabbeinu to get any higher and still be contained in a material body. As he said, no living man will see me. Meaning that Moshe Rabbeinu not only perfect his intellect to the highest level, even higher than Shlomo HaMelech, but his character traits were perfected at the highest possible level, hence the reason why he's constantly mentioned in Torah that he was the humblest man that ever lived. The, low, the, the more humble a person is, the more perfect of a character he is, but only if it's real humility. Because there is a fake humility that's actually the highest level of arrogance unfortunately i've been privied to meet a few of these people where the person pretends to be humble meaning they pretend oh yeah yeah no you know i don't know anything no no you're like one of those people yeah what do we care what do we know who what what are we what are this but in reality the second you say something to him that he doesn't like. The second you, figuratively speaking, step on his toe. Oh, how can you do it? I don't like it. Huh? Wait, I thought that you were nothing. I thought that you were like, uh, you know, sand we can walk on. I thought you were nothing. All of a sudden you're uh, not only not nothing, you're like a tower. Tower of Babel. This is fake humility. And fake humility, as I learned from my dear Rav, fake humility is the highest form of arrogance. Fake humility is the highest form of arrogance. Pretend to be humble, but in reality, it's just fake. It's the highest form of arrogance. And that's what the sages teach us. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu was real humble. Find any humble man on planet Earth. Moshe Rabbeinu was more humble than him, even though he was much smarter than him, even though he was much stronger than him, even though he was much richer than him, even though he had literally an infinite amount of reasons to be more confident and more arrogant than him, he was more, he more humble than him. Now, humble doesn't mean self-conscious. Humble means you know where you come from. Humble means that you have a direct understanding, a clear understanding of the source of every single thing that you have and you know that it's not due to you. It's not your idea, it's not your money, it's not your nothing. And he completely absolved his own self-interest and replaced it with the will of God. So Moshe Rabbeinu knew that he got to the highest level and that's why he had the confidence to ask Hashem, let me see you. Meaning he knew where he stood. But that was due to his humility. And Hashem says, you've reached the highest possible level that a human being can reach. You've reached the highest possible level. That's why the message to you is the five books of Moses. It's as clear as day. Anyone that reads it will understand at least part of the message, even if they're not a prophet. Even if they're not a prophet, they'll understand part of the message. 
Don't understand. Bereshit bara Elokim, meaning Hashem created the world. Don't understand. Hashem created the world. Believe, not believe, all that stuff, it's a different story. But as far as understand what it says, you'll understand part of the message, sure. Now, since our sages knew that these shortcomings, two shortcomings, the ethical and intellectual failings, separate man from God, and that this distinguishes the prophets, the sages said in the Gemara Masechet Sutta, page 28, and also Baba Batra, page 134a, that with regards to some of their colleagues whose wisdom and ethical development they saw, they are fit for the divine presence to rest upon them, as it rested upon Moshe Rabbeinu. He said, don't make the mistake and think that they, by the sages comparing their colleagues with Moshe Rabbeinu, that they're comparing them literally to Moshe Rabbeinu. But rather, says the Rambam, they are saying that in regards to their character traits, they have perfected this particular character trait in a way like Moshe Rabbeinu perfected his in his level. So that's why just like Hashem rested his shechina on Moshe Rabbeinu, he should rest his shechina on this magnificent tzaddik that's next to us. So this Rabotai is one of the clearest message about prophecy and who Hashem chose to be prophets. This also tells us who Hashem cannot and will not choose as prophets because the people that many times claim to be prophets have literally the exact opposite traits. They're arrogant, they're obnoxious, they think that they are a big deal because they are prophets. But of course you're going to say, yeah, but look, Bilam, Bilam was a Rasha, Bilam was even married to a donkey, so how, how is he a prophet, right? Bilam was a Rasha, you're right. And the Gemara in Masechet, Abu Dazara, asked the same question. And the Rambam says he wasn't a prophet. Rambam says he was a wizard. He was a wizard. He got some messages from God, but he wasn't really a prophet per se. Either way, the Gemara says in the case that he was a prophet, there's a way to understand it. Why? The Torah calls Bilam the man with one eye. Why with one eye? Because he had one eye and the other socket that's supposed to be an eye was a hole. He had a hole in his head. And therefore he did not sin with this hole. He can't do anything with it. And that's where, that's the vessel that Hashem used in order to bring him prophecy. The only part of his body that he didn't sin. There he can give him prophecy. The rest of his body was full of tumah. So here we see that if you look at the verses, you look at what the sages explain and you'll understand a whole lot more. Now, of course, none of us are prophets or sons of prophets, we're descendants of prophets perhaps, but not sons of prophets, but yet we have the same tool as them. Number one, we have the Torah. Number two, we have the number one most important tool that the prophet has, which is their mouth. Now, if a person uses their mouth for foul language, for lashon hara, for uh, gossip, for lies, for cheating, then in essence, they're not only violating the Torah by making those specific sins, but they're also desecrating the holy tool that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them. Now, the Rambam writes in Chod Brachot, in chapter 1, Alachan number 3, and number 4, which the Yakut Yosef brings in his introduction, that the blessings that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, gave us, as far as from the Torah itself, is Birkat Mazon. But yet the sages instituted blessings for everything else, for food, for drink, for anything that you benefit from this world. But yet it's still considered as if you're following the word of God. Why? The Rambam writes as follows. He says, there are three categories of blessings. Blessings for partaking in physical pleasures, blessings for performing mitzvot, and blessings for thanking Hashem. The last category is to uh, praise Hashem, acknowledge, uh, acknowledge uh, Him, and request things from Him. 
But ultimately, what is the purpose of all blessings? The ultimate purpose, says the Rambam, of all of the blessings is that we're constantly aware of God and fear Him. This is why the Gemara says that if a person consumes benefits from this world without blessing Hashem, they're considered like Yerovam ben Nevat. Why? Because Yerovam ben Nevat disconnected Am Yisrael from their creator by putting two golden calves in the way of going to the Bet Mikdash. So therefore, they didn't go. When a person blesses Hashem, they're in essence recognizing Hashem. They're showing that they fear Hashem. So by not blessing, it's the opposite effect. And therefore, the Rambam teaches that the fundamental purpose of the blessings is to promote Yirat Shamayim, to promote fear of Hashem. And Rav Elazar Menachem Shach, Allah Shalom, in his sefer called Machshevet Musa, he says that besides being an expression, that blessings are an expression of thank you for the food that, uh, that he's eating, or reciting a blessing that uh, declares that, uh, uh, that he's, uh, he's grateful for Hashem, a blessing itself is declaring that you are aware that Hashem is the creator, the one and only creator. That you're declaring that God is the one who brought this bread from the ground and created the fruits and the gr- uh, of ground, uh, that he created the fruits of the ground and the plants and the trees and each blessing that you make raises us another notch of our awareness that Hashem created everything in the world. In so many words, it's not just fear of punishment, but rather it's fear of His majesty. Now what's fear of His majesty? First and foremost, you have to recognize that His majesty exists. Now you can't just say, oh, the majesty is some big castle in the sky. No, majesty is here. When a person says, Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam, that blessed are you Hashem, our God, King of the world. There are some fools out there that say, yeah, he's King of the world, but not me. King of the world, but not me, meaning he's allowed to say, he's going to say the blessing on food, on bread, on drinks, or whatever. Yeah, Baruch Hashem, uh, you know, he's going to say Baruch Hashem on a lot of things. King of the world on a lot of things, but when it comes to him doing something specific that God said, he won't do it. She won't do it. Why? He's king of the world, but, uh, you know, it's hard for me. What do you mean hard for me? He's king of the world, but not you. So that's what Rav Shach here is emphasizing. Fear of Hashem is not just fear of some figure in the sky. Fear of Hashem is understanding and fearing His majesty here in your world, here in your life, in your every single second that you think. Now, when we thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything, the Tzedal Adech says this in itself, being careful with blessings and using our mouth for blessings and not for profane things, will automatically help us control our desires. Each time you make a blessing, it helps you with controlling your desires. If you see a person that does whatever, whenever, you can be sure that a person doesn't make any blessings. If you see a person that says he makes blessings, it even sounds like they make blessings, but they also don't control themselves very well, pay attention to the way they say their blessings. You'll notice that many times their blessings are a bunch of uh, words that are squashed together don't really even make any sense in fact one of the uh, Chachamim from the world of Hasidut Rabbi Belz was not only he a tzaddik in a gadol but he was married to a big tzaddika and the Rabbanit saw one time one of the Hasidim pick up a piece of cake and mumble a blessing quickly just to get to eat it she approached him, the rabbinit, rebuking you. It's even worse than the rabbi rebuking you sometimes. She says to him, let's think about what just happened here. This cake is made of wheat flour. 
Now, when these wheat flowers, wheat kernels, were growing in the field, they prayed constantly to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to allow them to grow sufficiently and that they're not cut down before they have a, ch a chance to ripen properly. And in response, HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded the guardian angels to protect them and help them grow as there's an angel above every single wheat kernel, every single leaf, every single a uh, 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 grass piece. Every single thing, there's an angel there either protecting them or removed from them so they get destroyed. That's what the Chobot HaLevavot said a thousand years ago. Each body part that we have has angels. When Hashem wants to rebuke a person, He simply removes some of these angels from those body parts and all of a sudden you start feeling pain. All of a sudden, you have bleeding from strange places. You do tshuva. Hashem says to the angel, go back. And all of a sudden, the angel comes back and you feel perfect. This, by the way, is the clear and outright explanation for medical miracles. Where you see somebody sick, and the next moment, the tumor is gone. The cancer is gone. The uh, things are gone. How? He did tshuva, she did tshuva. Kadosh Baruch decided to make a miracle. How's the miracle? It wasn't changing nature. It was simply returning nature to how he created it. What happened was the person made sins and shouldn't want to get his attention. So he told the angels, leave. Leave that liver. Let, let the rest of the uh, Malachi Chabala take over the liver. Let uh, the rest, rest of the Malachi Chabala take over the lungs, take over the brain. All of a sudden, the person is bleeding. All of a sudden, start losing their vision, their hearing. They're in their deathbed. Rabbi comes, says, listen, take on yourself tshuva, complete tshuva, your wife tshuva, your kids tshuva, your kids going to synagogue, they're going to yeshiva, your wife is only going to be modest. No more games. Okay, okay, Rabbi, I'll do it. Next day, the guy's walking out of a hospital. How? Simple. Kadosh Baruch returned the angels. He returned the angels to the body parts. The body part, the body came back to what, it's, what it was beforehand. That's why I always tell people, tell me, listen, can you pray for my such and such, my son, my cousin, my brother, my mother, they're sick. I always tell them, they have to take on mitzvot. It's good if you take something on yourself. Whatever you take on yourself, give a lot of stakar in there on their behalf. Uh, you know, uh, learn more to uh, do more mitzvot. If you're a woman, be more modest, whatever it is. But especially the things that you're obligated to do. But there is nothing better than the person themselves taking something upon themselves to such an extent that anything that you do for them is almost powerless, almost powerless in comparison to what they do for themselves. Now, of course, you can help a person, like we saw in the story of the Baba Sali last week. But Akadosh Bahu didn't make those, uh, didn't make that miracle for naught because he knew that once he, once those two women did tshuva. The husband had to do tshuva as well. Either way, Rabotai, the Rebbe Tzin from Belz saw that this young chassid ate the cake without really seeing a proper blessing. And she says, when those wheat kernels, when those wheat kernels were growing, they were praying to Hashem to allow them to grow completely and not be cut off. And therefore, Kadosh Bahu commanded the angels that are supervising them to protect them. And then, those weak kernels prayed again that when they grow, that a Jew takes them. Why? Because a Jew can say a blessing over them and help them complete their tikkun. A Jew can eat them and, and say a blessing. And after a Jew purchased this wheat kernel, each kernel prayed that it should not become lost during the threshing and the milling. And then after they did that and it became flour, the flour prayed that it should bake well and not burn. And finally, the cake, the cake wanted to be blessed upon so it completes this entire path from being this little 
weakling uh, seed in the you know bottom of the ground, under the sand, under all the dirt, and finally he got to be the cake in the hand of a Jew. All it needed is one more thing, one more blessing, and it completes his tikkun. And she says, instead of it bringing honor to God that it was looking forward to through your blessing, you burst its bubble by reciting a, bless, a blessing hastily without even thinking of what the words even mean. That's what happened here. I don't think that that Hasid ever made the same type of blessing again. In Be'ezot Hashem, neither will we. This Rabotai shows us a little bit, a little bit of the power of the mouth. But if that's not enough, we'll finalize with one last point. The Ben Yishchai that's brought here by Rabbi Tzak Yosef in his Parashat Pinchas, he says that Am Yisrael is compared to a worm. Am Yisrael is compared to a worm by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 41, verse 14, where it says, do not fear, worm of Yaakov. Why is Isaiah the prophet comparing Am Yisrael, which is Yaakov, to a worm? Our sages explain that a worm is a weak creature, but despite being weak, despite being fragile, it has a mouth. And that mouth, if it's used the proper way, can break through and penetrate the hardest substance out there. That's how Am Yisrael is. Am Yisrael is not known as the strongest people, but yet using its mouth, says the Ben Ishchai, it can achieve the greatest accomplishment. We affect the world immeasurably through our Torah study and through eating and drinking in the proper manner. And our prayers also depend on our mouth. In recognition of these powers, the prophet Isaiah called our nation the worm of Yaakov. Here we see Rabotai Kalim that a person can think of a worm only in a negative way until they hear the words of the sages and then they realize, wow, look at the significant powers that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave the worm. On the other hand, if a person doesn't use their mouth in a proper fashion, there was a tzaddik named Rabbi Yehuda Achasid, lived about 600 years ago, or more actually, and almost 800 years ago, around the time of the Crusaders in Machshiban Vezichan. Crusaders, even though the historians like to portray them as righteous people, they were some of the most evil people that ever existed since the world was created. They would literally go from Jewish community to Jewish community and massacre thousands of them in the most heinous ways, unless they converted to, to uh, Christianity, to their idolatry. They literally would go to different places, different cities in Poland and all over Europe with warriors, some of which were literally like giants and just kill people by the masses. They would gather them up in a square in the middle of the town and then line them up. Do you accept Christianity or no? No, chop off their head. Next guy comes, chop off their head. Literally, no, there's no discussion. They didn't, it wasn't even like, like, like Nazi Germany. It was worse. And these crusaders did this in the name of Christianity, which baffles my mind when the more I learn about this and think at the same time of some of the so-called Orthodox Jews and Orthodox rabbis that have suddenly forgotten. I'm not saying to go and fight against the Christians, but at the same token, how are you welcoming them into the synagogue? Did you forget? Maybe uh, Biden is reminding us by telling us about uh, how he told Bibi Netanyahu that it's time for him to meet Jesus, like he did a couple of weeks ago, twice. Anyway, 
This tzaddik kadosh, Rabbi Yehuda Hasid, was born around that same time. And in fact, now I'm remembering, at the time of the Crusades, people were asking questions. Why did Hashem allow this? There was literally a tax. There was a, they were just going to a town. 6,000 Jews in there, 6,000 Jews died. Another town, 8,000, they killed everybody. Literally was massacre upon massacre. Horrible. You know, the, the historians portray it's the war of the Christians versus the Muslims. They forget to mention the biggest victim being the Jews. Anyway, people ask questions. About 600 years ago, Rav Yom Tov Hillel, one of the Gdolim in that time and throughout history, said the reason, he wrote clearly a whole tshuva about this, that the reason why Hashem allowed that particular massacre that took place at that time was because the Jews were talking in shul. Now many people, oh, how can you say? But it wasn't really a chidush. In fact, Rabbi Yehuda Hasid preceded him by 200 years and wrote the same exact thing, where he says, talking and frivolous behavior are forbidden in a synagogue, where we are standing before our king, lord of the entire world. Woe to the wicked who act silly and do not feel any awe of the Almighty, and who do not take an example from the pagan nations. Just travel the sea to the faraway islands where there still are people who worship idols there. There you will see kings bowing down before their gods, standing in their temples in awe, reverence and trembling. They spread out their hands in prayer to man-made statues that could neither see nor hear. We who stand before the King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed be He, the living and enduring God, exalted and uplifted, to whom all glory and praises are due, surely must approach Him with awe and reverence, fear and trembling. Now you may wonder, oh here, so up to this point he's talking about how you talk in shul, you're worse than an idol worshiper. Why? Because at least the idol worshiper actually respects his idol. Whereas you're not even respecting the real king of kings, the real one and only God. So this, Abu Tai, is a rebuke of all rebukes to anybody that uses the synagogue as a socializing place. And it's not only during prayer. That just makes it worse. Shulchan Aruch calls somebody that talks during prayer as a sin that's too big to imagine. The sin, is, that's the only thing in the Torah that he writes this about. It's too big. Now, even if it's not during prayer and you're socializing in synagogue, it's also not, not allowed. It's also not allowed. You make the uh, synagogue into some type of hangout, not allowed. Rabbi Yom Tov Heller writes harshly against it. Rabbi Yudah Hasid writes harshly against it. And many Chachamim speak against it. But unfortunately, many people don't realize until disaster strikes. But furthermore, there's a point here. We see here how the same mouth that can elevate itself through prayers, through Torah study, through positive speaking, through teaching, can also lower itself to being literally a weapon against its own people. A weapon against its own people where they speak heresy, or lies, or cheat, or speak in shul, things that are not supposed to be in a shul. These are turning the gift that Hashem gave you into a curse, into a weapon, meaning the same tool that can elevate itself to the point of receiving prophecy can bring disaster. Now, he elaborates further about speech and uh, what about people that don't speak properly, not because uh, intentionally, but rather because they have a stammer or a uh, or a, um, a stutter. 
He says, don't be confused about this. Our creator knows the heart and he only asks the person to be sincere. And if someone cannot speak properly, Hashem counts it as the most beautiful recitation. So here, for a person who doesn't know how to speak proper Hebrew, if your heart is proper, then don't worry, those words are, are arriving to Hashem proper. On the other hand, if your words are proper, but your heart isn't, he says as follows, people who lift their heads and eyes towards the ceiling in show of piety are ridiculed by the angels who call them blockheads, meaning you're looking at the sky while you're praying, you're pretending to be righteous, you're pretending to be, you know, a tzaddik, but in reality, Hashem knows what's in your heart. The angels know what's in your heart. And instead of bringing your prayer to Hashem, they make fun of Him. And they even have, even gives them names, blockheads, apparently. The prayers are mocked. So, the Gemara says, what does a Kadosh Baruch Hu want? He wants our hearts. He wants our hearts. When we give a Kadosh Baruch Hu our hearts, just like our Shema Yisrael says, love Hashem with all of your heart. When we give Hashem all of our hearts, we can literally elevate our speech to only saying good things that are truthful and not good things to just pacify people. We can elevate our speech to teach Torah. We can elevate our speech to create Shlom Bayit. We can elevate our speech to pray to our Kadosh Baruch Hu in a sincere way. We can elevate our speech to the point where our Kadosh Baruch Hu can make it prophecy. Now, even if we don't get to the level of prophecy with our speech, the path there is full of joy for the one who's doing it as well as the world that's around him that's able to hear and enjoy those holy words that are coming out of his or her mouth. So even if you don't become a prophet, and I don't become a prophet, acting in the ways of the prophets certainly is not just a worthy cause, but rather is the purpose of life. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu gave us all the details about those prophets more than any of the others because they perfected themselves at the highest possible level. And even if we can't get to their level, even to get to the level of the dust under their feet, we still have knowledge of what they did and we can do the best we can to reach it. That's what the Rambam writes. Where the difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and Isaiah was enormous. But as Isaiah still reached his full potential and still became the greatest prophet aside from Moshe Rabbeinu. Let's all take upon ourselves to start using our mouth only to do the will of Hashem. Only to tell the truth. Only to say what's permissible to say. If you simply do that, I can guarantee that you're at least on the path that the prophets also took. Because it'll eliminate all the shonara, all lying, all deception, in fact, all evil from your life. Thank you very much for learning with me. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless each and every one of us to continue getting closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his prophets and his sages and most importantly, to follow his Torah regardless of what the Yitzhah tells us. Because through thick and thin, Hashem is with us. And we should always be with him. Call to B'chav anyone that wants to support all the amazing things that the organization is doing. Please donate on bhtorah.org or bezatashem.org or the Purim campaign, bhpurim.org. In so many words, a lot of different websites that we have and different avenues for you guys to be able to fulfill mitzvot and to join us and partner with us in all the things that we're doing together. Call to B'chav